Good afternoon, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the GCSP public discussion on Ecological Threat Report 2022, Building Resilience, Climate, Ecology and Conflict. Uh, welcome to the audience here in the room, uh, but as well to all of you joining us online. There is a big group of you there and we are very happy to have you. My name is Anna Brach and I'm Head of Human Security at the Geneva Center for Security and Policy and it's my pleasure and privilege to moderate this discussion. So we are about to look at the links between climate change, ecological threats, population and movement of people trends and their potential impact on, on conflict trends. Uh, to discuss these issues, we have an excellent panel of speakers uh, with us. Uh, first, we will hear from Serge uh, Strobont who is the director of Europe and MENA region at the Institute for Economics and Peace. He's had a 25 years, uh, years of military career, including several military operations in the Balkans, Africa, NATO response force and the EU battle groups. And then he moved to academia where he specializes in political science, international relations, security and defense, global risk analysis, foresight and crisis management, a handful. And Serge will present the main findings of the ETR report. Next, we will he hear from uh, Ms. Monica Ferro, who's the director of the United Nations uh, Population Fund office in Geneva. Uh, for the past 20 years, she has worked to promote equality, development and human rights, including uh, in uh, public service in Portugal, during which she served as the Secretary of State for National Defense. And Monica will talk about demographics, uh, the trends, and the need to create demographic resilience and uh, rights and cho choices for all. And last but not the least, we will hear from <laughs> we will hear from uh, Mr. Andrew Harper, who's the special advisor on climate action and the United at the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees Office in Geneva. He's responsible for providing strategic guidance, oversight, and expertise to shape UNHCR's response to the climate emergency. He also has an extensive career extensive career in the organization, including in the field. Um, including Central and Southeast Asia, Western Balkans, Islamic Republic of Iran and Ukraine. And today he's going to talk about these issues from the vantage point of the UNHCR and their recent report on what's happening in Sahel. Uh, so all the speakers, if you you are, of course, aware that the UNFCCC COP is happening right now in Egypt, and all the speakers actually attended the, the, the conference. So I'm curious to hear some of their observations, their hopes, their fears of the upcoming results. Um, so we are going to hear first from Serge. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anna, for your kind introduction and also for organizing this uh, panel today. Thank you also to my fellow panelists who have accepted the, uh, the invitation and to sit uh, next to me and to Anna this, um, this afternoon. And thank you to the audience here in the room and definitely also uh, online. So what I'm going to do is um, use a PowerPoint and talk to you about the results and the key findings of the Ecological Threat Report 2022. Uh, first, a few words about the Institute for Economics and Peace. So we are an apolitical, non-for-profit uh, think tank. Um, what we do is uh, measure and quantify peace. We want to also identify the drivers of peace and understand the uh, intersection between business peace and economics. So basically we measure peace and we also identify the, uh, all the benefits that come along with a more peaceful situation. Um, we are an Australian think tank, so out of Sydney, Australia with the head office and we have offices distributed all over the world. I'm heading the office in Brussels, responsible for Europe, Middle East, North Africa. We have an office in Harare, Zimbabwe. New York, close to the UN, and Mexico City. Mexico City is uh, why? Because this is the country in which we're also producing a national peace index where we go under national level and compare the 32 Mexican states according to the levels of, um, of peacefulness. Uh, we have basically three main audiences. It's uh, first of all, um, I would say general audience, general public, making sure that we can inform as many uh, people as possible. And of course, putting behind this a lot of PR efforts to, to reach out to a, a general audience. The second one would be um, academic audience, making sure that the results, the facts, the figures, the analysis that we do are integrated into university courses and we also develop our own. Oh, we are part of all master's degrees uh, throughout the world. 
And thirdly, it's uh, clearly the policymakers and decision makers making sure, like Nick last week or this week at the COP27, uh, that they have the facts and figures and so also the analysis that allow them to really uh, understand what's going on, understand the systemic evolution of uh, certain um, uh, certain crises, and also making sure that they can come up with the right legislation, but definitely also with the right uh, decisions and right policies. Um, so we are ranking, as it, this is the third year that we are producing the ecological threat report. This report is looking, is looking at the interplay between the effects of ecological threats. Um, of course, we understand that those effects can be or will be reinforced by the effects of climate change. But what we also see is that only the ecological threats can lead or will lead to societal collapse of certain states in the world today. We don't even need the extra effects of the aggravating, accelerating factors coming from climate change to reach this level of societal collapse in potential uh, potential countries. So we have about 200, close to 230 uh, countries and independent territories on the um, on the report, uh, but we are also able here to go at least one level lower. So we are basically uh, comparing about 3,700, uh, what is written at 3,638 local administrative areas. So that's one level under the national level. And we're also able to compare, and that's just one specific chapter of this year's ecological threat report, we are able to compare cities and mega cities. Um, what we are looking at are four different domains of indicators. So basically, we have two baskets. One basket when we will clearly look at the effects of natural disasters, and the other one when we compare of offer and demand. So where is the scarcity? Of course, food and water, and we combine this with the demand, and that's the population growth and also the the presence of, uh, of population in the world and in specific regions of the world also. This allows us to have two measures of ecological threats, so the ETR score and the catastrophic score. Catastrophic score is looking at this, uh, this one indicator that is really impacting the most each of the countries. And this allows us to identify 20, 27 hotspot countries. Those hotspot countries are the countries with the highest level of impact of ecological threats and the lowest levels of resilience to cope with, uh, with those threats. So let's have a look at the key findings. So we see that today, 127 countries hosting more than 2 billion people face already catastrophic ecological threats. This is only going to increase in the next uh, 30 years. And we will see that in the same 127 countries, by 2050, we will have about 3.4 billion people. So that's an increase by 66%. And I will show you a slide, uh, slide later on in my presentation where well, you can clearly see that it is in those regions, and I, I would even go in those specific places within countries where the situation is the most difficult. So basically a situation where you have a systemic interconnection between a wide variety of different strategic factors influencing peace and security, but it's exactly there where it's the most difficult that the population growth is also the strongest. So clearly something that you would not like to see happening is definitely happening in those um, in, in those regions and in those specific places. We can clearly see, and this is this has been a constant uh, constant data of the three publications of the ecological threat report. This um, intimate relation between between ecological degradation or the, eco the the effects of ecological threats and levels of violence, and this clearly and reinforced and accelerated. Um, vicious uh, cycles. We can also see that when the ETR score is worsening, well, the levels of peacefulness are deteriorating. And we see that the vast majority of the, of the countries that are on top of these ecological threat reports, so most impact at least resilient, are also within the bottom 40 of our uh, global peace index, or the, the peace indexes that we produce also. So there, you can clearly start to have a first um, a first appreciation of this interaction of different factors, all concentrated in certain regions of the world or certain countries of the world, all interconnected and all accelerated, of course, creating destabilization, lack of resilience, eventually conflict, and eventually for some countries, crystallization of some form of conflicts into terrorism, or other forms of violence. We also see together to today that about 760 million people are suffering from undernourishment. You will see later on that this is not a new trend, and this is not a trend that has been generated neither by COVID nor by the crisis in uh, in Ukraine. 
We can also see that, uh, and that's a specific uh, evaluation that we have made uh, this year. It's about the perception globally of people. Uh, do they really see climate change as something that is going to negatively impact their future? Well, you we have seen that this perception is decreasing um, and is now just under 50%. Uh, and you will also see later on that it's, uh, the, this, uh, this uh, situation is probably is even, is even more complicated in um, those countries polluting uh, the most we have also seen that the world's fastest growing megacities are also the least capable of managing what's happening in their in their city. So that's something we need to, to have a look at. And we, of course, see that countries with high social societal resilience are also very um, uh, likely to achieve the ecological goals. Well, that's fine, especially when you look at Europe, least impacted, most resilient. So yes, we will achieve those goals, so we we'll participate in solutions, but this is also creating a responsibility to address the problems of other regions and other countries that will need the support to achieve their own ecological goals also. Uh, if we continue, of course, we see a concentration of the, of the problems in sub-Saharan Africa. This is a region of the world facing the biggest challenges. And, you know, when I'm presenting this now as the ecological threat report, I'm feeling like I'm presenting again the global terrorism index because I will tell you exactly the same. Or if I'm presenting the global peace index, well, of course, from a negative, negative approach, where you would see a concentration of those countries at the bottom of the global peace index. So that's clearly the region of the world where everything is interconnected, where so, uh, uh, systemic challenges are really creating a situation that is that is going to become, and is already today, in some parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, is becoming unbearable. We see that almost all the countries, maybe except one, are fa facing already severe water stress. We also see that uh, close to 90% of the people facing food insecurity are located in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, this is also the continent of the region where you will see, and that's absolutely um, an inverse uh, trend from the other regions of the world, where you will see an incredible increase of the population, up to 95% in the next 30 years. I will show you later on um, the, this table of the 15 countries who are going to double their population. Just take, take the example of Niger, located in the Sahel, of course, impacted by terrorism, lack of resilience and destabilization today. Well, you will see that the population, and it's already a problem today to take care of the entire population of Niger. They're going to almost triple the population in the next 30 years. So just imagine how much more this is going to create destabilization and, um, and intensity of the problems over there. We also see that uh, five megacities with the largest population growth, and I think Nair Nairobi is the one with the largest population growth in Sub-Saharan Africa. Well, five of those megacities are located in Sub-Saharan Africa. We also see that six of the 10 least peaceful countries, so the bottom, really the bottom 10 of the global peace index, six countries are from Sub-Saharan Africa. It's not written on the slide, but the Global Terrorism Index is explaining to you that the epicenter of terrorism today is in the Sahel region, is in Sub-Saharan Africa. Almost 50% of all the terrorist acts in the world are occurring in Sub-Saharan Africa. 35% alone will be in of, the, of all terrorist attacks in the world are in the Sahel region, which is basically in three countries. We see that two out of three of hotspot countries are located in Sub-Saharan Africa, and we also see that seven out of eight countries with the worst, worst ETR score are also located in Sub-Saharan Africa. So. I think this list is really impressive and showing you uh, the emergency, the urgency to act in this uh, part of the world. Um, for uh, almost all of our publications, you will find uh, on our website called visionofhumanity.org. You can find there in open source all our publications in full text, maps like interactive maps like this. Also, this PowerPoint is available on our, on our website. So clearly, first, what you see there is the color code. And you see that the color code is not only national. It's showing you, of course, this comparison of these administrative units. But it's definitely uh, allowing you to identify the hotspots. And of course, Sub-Saharan Africa is, is there. You can also see some countries in the Middle East, North Africa, going down to South Asia. And of course, some of the hotspot countries also located in uh, Southern uh, America. When we look at the different regions, we can clearly see the largest impact there in Sub-Saharan Africa, followed by South Asia, followed by, that's a little bit far away from me, uh, a third, I think it's South America, the third uh, region most, uh, most impacted. Uh, when we continue, if we look at the different country hotspots, so as I said before, uh, 20, 20 hotspot countries, and those are countries really facing um, the extreme ecological threats, but also the lowest levels of societal resilience. Uh, well, those 27 countries are home today to 736 million people, and I know that 
you know, when we presented the first ecological threat report, we, we identified 30 hotspot countries in which 1.2 billion people were living. Well, clearly, when you have a country in which you have high impact, and it's not only high impact of ecological threats, but high impact of several um, indicators or several uh, strategic factors in peace and security, and at the same moment, this country cannot take care of, the, of this impact, well, you can just imagine that those people are at risk. Of course, of the combination of different elements are at risk of moving. Um, of course, we, we know the figures, about 85% of the people will try to move uh, just to, for a short period of time and a short distance, but you will still have 15% of people who might want to, to find another or better future somewhere else or in, in another place uh, uh, in the world. So clearly there, those hotspot countries are those that we need to, uh, to keep an eye on or to start intervening in, and we need to, to do this in a systemic way for sure. Clearly there, that's uh, another identification of the national hotspot, the 27 national hotspots, so clearly uh, a concentration there, as we already explained before, in sub-Saharan Africa. So now we look at the different ecological threats. We can talk about food security. Uh, we see today that um, 41 countries are facing extreme food insecurity. That's about 830 million people. Um, again, there is Sub-Saharan Africa really overrepresented, and I think it's really that's an amazing figure. Uh, what's going, what's happening today in Sub-Saharan Africa? It's 14 times higher than the MENA region that ranks second on this on this ranking. So clearly, it's not only they're not only position one, but it's also outbound compared to the other the other regions of the world. Uh, of course, there is a link there with low, low peace and low resilience countries. We see that 92% of the people uh, being food insecure live in such countries. And uh, we have also seen that the largest deterioration since 2019 occurred in countries like Colombia, Syria, Ethiopia and um, Mozambique. As I explained to you before, this is a trend which changed us of 2017, so before COVID and before the Ukraine crisis. But of course, those two global crises uh, have influenced also this uh, a phenomenon which already started before and is now, of course, reinforced by those two different, uh, different crises. When we look at water security, um, we understand that uh, basically food is a byproduct of water. Uh, and in the global launch, we worked together with um, an NGO called Too Good To Go. And I was really impressed by the way they were presenting because they were basically uh, explaining to us that everything that you take, it, that you can eat, is representing a certain amount of liters of water. So since then, every time I eat, and eat an apple, I'm realizing I, it's 70 liters of water I'm taking into, or that were necessary also to produce this apple, for example. So you know, when you have this, this approach, it's completely different when you realize, of course, the link between water and uh, food. We see that uh, more than 1.4 billion people globally are exposed to extreme levels of uh, water stress, and that's in more than uh, in 80 countries. There again, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, Latin America, uh, suffer from the worst uh, water stress, but we also see that this water stress um, will uh, emerge and generate also in uh, even in Europe. Of course, we have the examples like Greece, uh, Italy, Portugal, the Netherlands for different reasons. I can also relate to my own country, Belgium, where you know we put so much concrete on the soil that it's almost difficult to capture any form of water in uh, in, in my in my own country. So we're also facing, especially in uh, in the northern part of, of Belgium, facing water stress just for another reason, but we're also facing the same type of, uh, of reason. I've also seen that uh, this has been a trigger for more and more conflicts over the past, uh, past two decades. And of course, countries like Iraq, Somalia, Yemen have been at the heart of those conflicts for water over the past uh, 20 to 30 years. Uh, we see that over in, on certain streams, on certain major streams, just like the Mekong or the Nile, Damming has been organized, and of course that's going to be positive for a certain amount of people, but it's definitely it might become negative, and not only for security reasons, also for survival reasons, for a huge number of people, and you see it's 300 million for the Mekong and 200 million for the Nile, living downstream of those, uh, of those dams. When we look at the population growth, that's exactly what I explained to you before. If you follow the yellow line, so the yellow line is the low peace countries. Well, you see that it's in the, those low peace or lowest peace uh, level of co countries that the population growth is the strongest. And really, when you go down to those administrative units, we can clearly see that it's in those specific places where the situation is the worst that the population growth is the most intense. And that's clearly something that we need to take into account because it's already very difficult today. So just imagine what's going to be in 30 years from now. As I promised you, the 15 countries that are going to double uh, or at least double their population in the next uh, 30 years in, in Africa, um, 
you know, Niger, Angola, Uganda, Somalia, you, can already, you, you already know what the situation is there today. Just imagine how this is going to impact that. When we look at natural disasters, we see that Asia Pacific is most impacted at the moment, uh, followed by Sub-Saharan Africa, Central America and the Caribbean. We have also seen that the cost or the average cost of uh, natural disasters has quadrupled over the past 40 years. So where on an annual basis natural disasters would cost 50 billion in the 1980s, it's above 200 billion today. So there again, we see that ecological threats reinforced by climate change has a, a very strong economic impact uh, just by the, the price that you need to pay for those natural disasters. And we know that they come more often and we know that they are more intense than they were 40 years ago. And this is only going to grow in the, in the coming years. Uh, flooding is the most uh, common natural disaster since the, the past 40 years with more than 5,000 uh, events or events over the, the past 40 years. And we also see that um, of the 27 uh, hotspot countries, well, uh, we, we have seen that for countries of Afghanistan, Haiti, Tajikistan, Nigeria and Mali, so not really the most resilient countries, as you can imagine. Definitely most of them countries really in uh, deep forms of conflict also. Well, we have seen that the biggest increase in natural disasters were for, for, those, for those countries. So you can clearly see there again a concentration of everything that, that is going wrong in the same, uh, in the same places. Uh, when it comes to disaster and conflict displacement, of course, those figures uh, were the figures that were in the last or latest reports by UNHCR for sure. I think the, r the real figures now, especially with the, um, the effects of the Ukrainian conflict, we passed the, the mark of 100 million people displaced in the world and, and, and higher than that also. Of course, there is a combination there of conflict and natural disasters, which, which are generating those uh, this displacement, um, but as those two elements are closely interacted, basically it doesn't matter where, why people are displaced, and we all understand, and I think especially on the panel, that it's a combination of different factors that is forcing people or moving people to, uh, to really get on the road and, and move. Uh, so we need to also have a systemic solution there to make sure that we can take that into account. Uh, Usually, displacements for natural disasters are short term, but it all depends on the level of resilience of your country. Uh, in last year's ecological threat report, we compared Japan and Haiti, who had faced the same type of natural disasters. I don't need to explain to you that the answer uh, to, the, to that in Japan was completely different to the, the potential or the lack of, uh, uh, I would say, approach that you would, uh, that you would have seen in, in Haiti. And therefore, Japanese could go much faster and quicker to uh, uh, to the b back to the country or the, the region of origin or place of origin where it's still chaos in, in Haiti uh, today. Uh, uh, now when you look at the largest uh, conflict displacement in 2021, it's still Syria, Ethiopia, the DRC, Afghanistan and South Sudan. And of course the neighboring countries are those receiving the most uh, refugees. So we're talking about Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, Uganda, and of course that's more than 6.5 billion people in those countries. Of course, also imposing a stress on those uh, on those different countries, and of course we we also took some very low percentage of displaced person in uh, in Europe, but we all know that this is definitely creating um, a political problem in Europe also. About the climate survey, so down, point, down par, uh, by 1.5 percent, about 48 percent of the people globally uh, think that. Um, uh, climate change uh, is a global concern for them and is going to impact uh, their livelihoods in the future. Uh, those more aware of more concern of this are the Southern Americans, a bit uh, 65%. The lowest, the MENA region, 27 uh, I can assume or I guess that uh, people there have uh, other more pressing uh, stresses that they need to, uh, to address and, and maybe other incentives that they need to take care of. And we also see that um, yeah, Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia ranked other, other indicators like war, terrorism, um, crime and violence before uh, climate change. Now when you look at uh, those figures, you see that uh, from the four largest polluters, well in two, uh, in two countries like China and Russia, the perception dropped and you can clearly see that uh, in countries like China it's just above 20% and in India and, and Russia it's about 35%. So clearly there, there is an effort that needs to be done in educating uh, people in the effects of climate change and making sure that the um, population, they also understand that this is going to have an impact, already having an impact on their livelihoods. Uh, when we look at mega cities, we can clearly see a continued trend of people uh, leaving the countryside and uh, going more and more, leave more and more into cities. We all understand that not going to rent a nice flat in the city center, just going to create 
to uh, you know uh, uh, extend the city so the city at the, at the margins of the city is not really in the best uh, live in the best conditions there and we can also um, realize that you know those cities are not really uh, don't really have the financial assets so also the management skills to co to cope with this uh, um, increased uh, increased population but also all the other uh, societal uh, aspects of uh, such uh, increase in populations so of course crime violence health uh, air pollution, quality of the air, a lot of different aspects that they cannot really absorb of, or take care of and therefore only reinforcing a problem that is only already existing. We see that today we have about 34 mega cities. This is going to increase to 47 by 2050. Uh, again, their concentration in, uh, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa and also uh, Asia and South Asia. Uh, and we can clearly see, yeah, I mean, the, f the figures are showing that really the management of those mega cities is going to be more and more problematic in the, in the years to come. And I think one of the figures that we that we published in the ETR was uh, figures coming from uh, the OSCD that um, by 2050, only air population in those mega cities is going to cost about eight trillion US dollars per year. On, on um, yeah, on per, per year. So just there again, a huge economic impact by not taking into account or inaction on uh, climate uh, climate change. I think I'm pretty close to the end of my presentation. So we're not only proposing facts and figures. Of course, we are trying to also uh, bring some policy recommendations. So we clearly identify that current policies will not be enough to reverse the deteriorating environment uh, of the poorest and least peaceful countries. So clearly there, they, you need extra help, or you need, as I said before, for those, you know, we will, we will uh, reach the ecological uh, goals. Well, there is also a, a responsibility there to, to help others. Uh, we can clearly see that uh, the countries with the highest resilience will uh, manage their way, uh, but therefore this responsibility. What we also see is that, uh, and I think I, I try to uh, generate this perception through my presentation, we are facing uh, systemic challenges. Uh, we need systemic solutions for that. So you need to organize the analysis in a systemic way also. So you need to organize your uh, multilaterals. So you need to organize basically the tools that are dealing with, uh, with the challenges in such a way that, uh, it's, that it's making a systemic analysis uh, possible. And, and as an institute, we are proposing, of, of course, solution in this way also. And we're doing a lot of research in system, uh, system thinking. Um, yeah, and then I guess the easy solutions, you know, the micro water capture uh, projects or the refoliation projects. What we also see is a discrepancy between these uh, very highly strategic um, implementation plans and funding. We're talking about billions there, sometimes millions. And of course, the, the low levels and uh, micro credits uh, for micro projects. But those are usually also providing the right solutions. We can talk about sand dams, that's an, an, an investment by 50 to maximum $100,000. But you can really have a solution for over 50 years by doing so. Uh, really low key, low, uh, low, low level, low investment level. And then you have these mega strategic ones. What is in the middle? We, we miss something there to really manage this at, um, at the meso level. So that's another, another uh, incentive that we, that we put on the table there. So that's the end of my presentation. So more than happy to take questions at the end of this, uh, of this panel. You can follow us on our global uh, social media. As I said on our website, visionofhumanity.org, you have access to all the data, the maps, the PowerPoints. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for organizing this, having us again here at GCSP. It's really a nice tradition, and uh, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, Serge. Fantastic presentation, especially the detail and the level of uh, research that your institute is doing is really impressive and I really encourage everybody to take a look at the, um, at the report and other reports of the IEP and, uh, and follow this, this discussion as well. And now, having heard all of this, Monica, uh, this, this really dire um, analysis of, of the situation we are in, how does the United Nations Population Fund see it, especially that we just got our eighth, uh, eight billionth person on the planet? So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. Um, <clears throat> and let me start by um, thanking um, our hosts for, for this event and for having us, um, the United Nations Population Fund, joining you. And, um, and I have to say, first I have to comment on, um, on what Serge just um, presented to all of us. And I really liked your focus on this kind of three main ideas that 
data, and you've given us a lot of data, and we need data so that we can plan policies. You also mentioned that a lot, how we need policies that have to be driven by data, and how with those policies we can build resilience. And I think that um, it's, it's one of the key messages that we are trying also to push forward. And when we talk about demography and all the intersecting relations um, between um, the main um, findings you, you found here. And I have to say that this idea that these are systemic challenges that require systemic answers. I think this is really the call that all multilateral organizations need to um, to take home. Um, there's, um, you, I remember once Guterres, the Secretary General, saying, "Life doesn't happen in silos. Why do we insist in responding to life's challenges in a siloed way? You know, presuming that we can make a difference if we focus too narrowly on our uh, mandates." So, sound policies to build resilience. Um, I think that's the. Uh, that's what I'm going to try to take from your presentation uh, to mine. So I work for the United Nations, for the United Nations Population Fund. And um, actually, um, we were created um, in 1969 um, precisely to provide countries with data, with the demographic trends, so they could plan their social economic development, very much aligned with a scenario um, such as Sergio was presenting here today. If you remember, in 68, um, there was a book published called The Demographic Bomb that really put the whole world in alert. You know, population would grow faster than the resources available, so we would go, we would reach a moment where there was not enough food to sustain uh, the population, um, social chaos, political turmoil, conflict. And so the UN decided, why don't we create a thematic fund, a technical fund, that can help countries to um, identify and understand their demographic trends so they can plan ahead. And this is why we were created, of course, that, and this is why also we are the agency that today um, still helps developing countries in conducting the census. You know, counting population in your country and counting it in a very granular manner, it's probably the most <coughs> complex operation you can undertake in peacetime. And we want people uh, to be counted because they need to be taken into account when you are preparing um, your um, resilience policies, uh, as Sergio was saying. So, um, and of course, as, as time moved along, we are still focusing on numbers, but numbers are people. Numbers have people in it. So we also started to work on the drivers of these demographic trends. And this is why you will find UNFPA as the Sexual Reproductive Health Agency of the UN. This is why you will find us uh, being the lead agency on, maternal, on reducing maternal mortality, on providing universal access to family planning, on ending all forms of violence against women, and all the groups who are in a vulnerable situation. If you allow me to steal the mantra of the SDGs, when we say, a world with more dignity for all without leaving, with leaving no one behind, this is what we do. We focus on the ones who've been left the furthest behind so they can also reach the threshold of, the, of dignity that we want for us all. And we can do it because we know who they are and we know where they are. And this is why we work with young people, with older persons, with persons with disabilities, um, um, LGBTQI populations, because we know where people are and we know how to reach them. And also to bring them to the table because they've been absent for too long. And some of the threats and the challenges that Serge was just presenting us, they don't have the people who are most impacted by them sitting at the table, designing the policies and monitoring the, the policies. But as Anna was saying, um, I'm, I'm going to try to focus on the 8 billion. Um, I know that you all saw on the 15th of November, we reached 8 billion uh, people in the planet. And this was, um, this was a decision taken by UNDESA, who actually holds this uh, portfolio on the demographic trends. And we knew the number would reach in November. We didn't know precisely when. It's impossible to, to measure when the 8 billion person is, uh, is going to be born. But we decided half November would be um, sort of the most uh, correct date to celebrate it. And it was funny because I was in uh, Sharm el Sheikh. Um, and I was precisely sitting on a panel that, was, um, that the title was Enhancing Human Rights gender responsive uh, responses um, to climate change. So we tried also to, um, 
tackle the issue of climate change, but showing the impact, the disproportionate impact climate change has on um, people in vulnerable situations and how you really need a different lens. You need a human rights lens and you need a gender lens if you want to be able to respond to um, to climate change. And um, and I was listening, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to divert on this. If there's any questions on this, I'll be happy to take them, but on water. And it's it was really interesting. And I also found what Serge was saying, when you, when you, when you look to civil society organizations and how they present the evidence. And it's really interesting from an analysis point of view, then when you talk about water, maybe you don't think on certain aspects of my mandate. How can you do a safe delivery if there's no uh, running water? Where do you wash your hands? Where do you wash the utensils that you need to allow women to have a safe delivery? Or how can women manage their menstrual health and hygiene if they don't have access to water? So, you know, it's, the, it's what you were saying, it's the big trends, it's water scarcity, in food consumption, but these challenges are no lesser than, <laughs> than that one. And so this is why we are also developing this systemic approach, uh, approach to it. But on, on the 8 billion, we think it's a reason to celebrate. It's really a reason to celebrate. We live longer lives, healthier lives, who are more educated than ever. Um, just look at the gains we've, uh, we've managed to secure on gender equality. Um, just um, imagine what technology has done for us. So we are sitting here in a Palinol in Geneva and we have people connecting from many parts of the world. Many of you have your phone with you so you can WhatsApp your friends saying, I'm sitting in Geneva in this amazing panel when they are discussing. Really, technology has changed our lives in so many um, manners that we cannot even grasp quite what they are. But at the same time, just think how many millions of women and people in developing countries are offline. Just think how many people are uh, not undernourished, but in a, in a country where feminine has been declared. Or how many women still die every day out of childbirth, of um, uh, complications related to pregnancy. All those things that we know how to tackle and we know how to avoid. So if we think this is a reason to celebrate, we also think that 8 billion is um, a clarion call for, um, for action. And um, uh, yesterday, yesterday you know, on the 15th, you know, I came from Sharm el-Sheikh, so the days are kind of blurred because I traveled throughout the night. And, and I think it's the problem of Andrew and Serge too. Um, so, but um, Guterres, the, the UN Secretary General, was saying on the 15th, uh, unless we uh, unless we, bri we bridge the yawning chasm between the global haves and have-nots, we are setting ourselves up for an eight billion strong filled with tensions, mistrust, crisis, and conflict. But still, I'm going to focus on um, on this idea that this is a, su a success story. It's not a doomsday, and our world, despite its challenges, is one where higher shares of population are educated and live healthier lives that at any previous point in history. And I was quoting my amazing executive director, Dr. Natalia Cannon. So, but we know that um, demographically, we have a world more diverse uh, than ever before. Asia and Africa, they really drove much of the growth and they are expected to drive the next billion. We will probably reach the next billion in 2037. While Europe's contribution will be negative due to a declining population. India, the largest country to contribute to the 8 billion will surpass China, which was the second largest contributor to the 8 billion, and whose contributions to the next billion will be negative, as the world's most population by 2023 will be India. And this is important also for our geopolitical analysis. And um, we know, because that's been um, highlighted in many media, that while the world's population will continue to grow probably up to 10.4, 10.5 billion um, around 2080, that's the estimate we have, the overall rate of growth is slowing down. And we are still growing due to a phenomenon that's called population momentum, or if you want, demographic inertia. People are still having babies, whether planned or not, they are still having babies. So the population will continue to grow due to sort of phenomenon of inertia. It's like when you try to stop a car. Even when you hit the brake, 
the car still moves on for a couple of meters. I don't drive, so I'm, I'm making this up. Um, but I've heard this is how, this is how it works. Um, and also, we, we know that the world is very diverse, as, as, um, as Sesh was saying, with, with countries that are facing um, very different population trends, great, ranging from growth to decline, um, but all, linking it to um, climate change. Today, two-thirds of the global population lives in countries with low fertility context, uh, where the lifetime uh, fertility is now below 2.1 um, births for, for women. But at the same time, population growth has become increasingly concentrated in the world's poorest countries, most of which are in Sub-Saharan Africa. And of course, as it was mentioned here, and we, ha we highlighted a lot last, uh, last week, no, last days in Sharm El Sheikh, are the countries who are bearing the burdest, are bearing the hardest burden of uh, impact of climate change, the the countries who are who are, um, who are not polluting as much as as the rest. So when we try to explain the very complex linkages between population, sustainable uh, development, and climate change, we, we know that um, a rapid population growth will um, will make. Um, eradicating poverty, combating hunger and malnutrition, and increasing the coverage of health and education systems, it will make it more, difficultly, more difficult, and also achieving the SDGs, especially those related to health, education, and gender equality. Also, um, slower population growth, if you maintain it over several decades, can help to mitigate um, this environmental degradation, conflating population, we know that, but conflating population growth with the uh, rise in greenhouse gas uh, emissions, it ignores that the countries with the highest consumption are em and emissions are countries where the population <coughs> growth is already slow or even negative. Still, we focus on, on them. Um, and, and we also know that each time we reach this, threat, this threshold of another billion, um, the, que the, the world asks itself the same question. Can we sustain it? And the truth is that if we look, um, if you look behind, if you look back, sorry, history has shown us that yes, we can, we can accommodate more people in the pla in the planet. We just need to think systemically, have data, and build better policies. And um, and you also know that the pace of population growth has been declining since the since the 70s. It's taking us more years to reach each billion. And this is something that you need to um, that you need to be mindful. And since 2020, the rate of population growth has, um, has dropped below 1% for the first time. So we are growing less than 1% um, due precisely to what I was saying, the demographic inertia of the, um, uh, of the population. Um, let me just give you a couple of, uh, of data very quickly because all the data is available. If you go to UNDESA, or if you go to our web page and you look for UNFPA and you look for the 8 billion, you can find all the trends there and how we are um, seeing the trends. But two thirds of the global population lives in countries or areas where lifetime fertility is below 2.1 uh, per woman, as I was saying. The population of 61 countries or areas are projected to decrease by 1% or more between now and 2050. Um, ongoing to sustain low, uh, fertility, low levels of fertility, in some cases, elevated rates of immigration. More than half of the projected increase of the global population up to 2050 will be concentrated in eight, in eight countries, as, you, as Serge was mentioning. The Democratic Republic of Congo, Egypt, Ethiopia, India, Nigeria, Pakistan, the Philippines, and the United Republic of Tanzania. And countries of Sub-Saharan Africa are expected to contribute more than half of the increase anticipated through 2050. And of course, we also know that lower and, um, lower and middle income countries and low income countries um, have contributed to the majority of the eighth, uh, of the eighth billion, um, especially when you compare it with upper middle income and high income countries. And if you try to project already into the ninth billion, um, 920 million will live in lower middle income and lower income countries. The, the number we need, more than 400 million will be people 65 years and older, 150 million will be from 15 
to 29, and the population of children aged 14 and younger will be declining and contributing um, negatively um, to, um, to, to this number. Um, so uh, our call, if, if I may say on this, and, and following uh, what Anna said in the beginning, is um, we have the data. And we know that um, if you don't um, if you don't give rights and choices to people, if you don't allow them to make informed decisions about their health, about their um, about their dignity, our health will will suffer, our potential will uh, lay dormant, and our contributions will never materialize. It will be a lost opportunity for for development. But we do need to focus on numbers. And numbers matter so that governments and societies can develop the infrastructures and provide services. And I often give these two very clear examples. How many schools and hospitals do I need to build? And where should I build them? This is why you need the data. How many, what social safety nets must be established? And who are they designed to, um, uh, to protect? And this is why um, focusing on numbers is important, but focusing on numbers also, and um, I'm going to wrap up with this, focusing on numbers also um, distracts us from the real challenge, which is securing a world where 8 billion um, can have a good quality of life. Um, in an op-ed on um, 15 of November, in, in I'm sorry for the publicity, in Time magazine, um, my executive director said very clear that focusing on numbers alone threats people, treats people as commodities stripping them from their rights and humanity. And we have seen too often leaders setting targets for population size or fertility rates and the grievous human rights abuses that result from it. Let's be clear, when we talk about the problem with fertility rates or an ideal population size, we are really talking about controlling people's bodies. Uh, we are talking about asserting power over their capacity for reproduction, and you have many examples of it, whether by influence or by force, from policies where families are paid to have more children, to egregious violations like forced st sterilization, often suffered by ethnic minorities, indigenous peoples, and people with disabilities. <clears throat> so we know that past population uh, milestones have, met, have been met with panic, that the number uh, of people in the world will deplete our natural resources and fuel humanitarian crisis and climate change. And as I was saying, these fears have at times um, led to coercive demographic policies. Not only these policies are ineffective, but they also undermine people's human rights and can be dangerous for women and girls around the world. Um, I was saying in one of the events that we, um, that we had last week that um, one thing that surprises me, and, and, and I'm talking with um, decision makers, with people that inform the decision making, one thing that constantly surprises me is the surprise of governments and other stakeholders when they see the demographic trends. Because if there's a social science, science that's quite predictable, it's demography, because we work in long-term cycles. We work in 10 to 15 cycles. So these trends shouldn't come as a surprise. What these trends should lead countries to do is to identify the trends, understand the trends, and decide how they can adjust their societies to, um, to fit those trends. There's no demographic trend, good or bad per se. All trends are a starting point, whether the trend is that your population is increasing or your population is decreasing. And this um, population policies, as I was saying, they are they are too often focused on controlling women's bodies and controlling their reproductive rights. And I have something to share with you, but I think you are all aware of that. Women will not, will not allow it. Societies will not allow it. We need to find a new way of dealing with, um, with these trends. We need to prepare our societies for the trends. It's the other way around. We need to understand the data that was given to us here today. We need to understand how you can um, invest in human and physical capital, how you can invest in health, education, infrastructures, technology, to help countries raise productivity and thereby supporting the growing populations. But at the same time, you also need to, um, to look at populations where the, the decrease in numbers um, related to a, shrinking, to a shrinking labor force um, will impact on their social welfare systems. So the the idea behind these numbers and behind providing these numbers is that countries can anticipate trends, 
they can build good uh, policies based on these trends and they can design their, um, their development policies according to the population they're going to have, not according to the population they would like to have, because there's no magic number. That never existed. Um, those numbers are often uh, created to justify certain policies. No agency, no UN agency will tell you the ideal is to have this many of people or those many people. The ideal number is the population that you can um, secure with um, dignity in your country, that, can, that, that you can provide the conditions so they can live the, they can live, um, a healthy life. And if I may end on this note, if I can zoom in on these policies, um, enabling rights and choices for everyone, it's, it's really the way forward. Um, it's not by controlling um, bodies and controlling fertility rates that you will be able to tackle your challenges. Because also, even in countries that try to do it, the effects of such policies, they violate human rights, that's the first thing I want to say, but they also don't have a short-term impact because everything in demography happens in long-term cycles. And this is quite, this is quite important when you, when you think about demographic resilience. It's about creating societies that fit people, not trying to um, hammer the, the number of population you have in your own country so they can fit your, um, your infrastructures or, or, or your policies. And this is why we focus so much on uh, um, reproductive rights, on reproductive health, because we see it often as the bargaining chip when you are scared because you didn't plan for um, the population that you have. And this is why we say no trend is good or bad. You just need to be prepared for that. And you have the data. You have the analysis done by think tanks, by civil society organizations, by institutes such as this one. You just need to take into consideration those trends and, and, and plan for it. And climate change, of course, bears um, a burden on, on this. And one of the um, key words, I, one of the key sentences I heard last week, it's not last week, it's this week, I'm sorry, I'm really still messed up by all the flights. Um, in Sharm El Sheikh, were um, advocates saying, a person is not a unit of emission or consumption of greenhouse uh, gases. A person is, a, is an entity with human rights. And again, think twice if you think that the people who are polluting the most are the ones living in developing countries with the higher population rates. It's just thinking twice and taking all the data that we have in front of us. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much, Monica. Thank you so much for, for pointing us to the, the importance of, of really well-established uh, policies that take, uh, take into account the trends. And, you know, in our courses at the GCSP and other events, we talk a lot about, you know, how short-sighted our planning is, and we actually have to take into account what you were just talking about. So now, uh, last but not the least, um, we will give the floor to Andrew, who has a short presentation, so we are waiting for it to be uh, uploaded. And I just wanted to uh, reassure you that I'm looking at my phone, not because I'm rude, but because I'm checking for any potential uh, comments or questions from the public online. So I'm getting them on my WhatsApp. So also a call for uh, public online to send us those uh, for the Q&A. But now, uh, Andrew, the floor is yours. No, th thank you very much. And um, thank you very much for the invitation um, to be here today. Um, I probably like I don't really have to say very much after um, the comprehensive um, discussion so far and and all the data and points that have been made. So um, what what I'll probably do is try and keep this relatively short and just hopefully there will be some um, some questions that come through so we can drill down into what people actually want to um, to discuss. But probably further going on to um, both what Serge and Monica mentioned, um, what UNHCR, the refugee agency, is, is particularly concerned about is that um, the title of this is Resilience, Climate, Ecology and Conflict. But what happens with conflict? You then have violence and then you have displacement. And given the um, very uplifting discussion and uh, prognosis that um, Serge was able to give, um, I think it's, it's obvious that we have to be much more prepared for an increasingly unstable and, and chaotic world. And just to react, as many agencies have, um, including humanitarian agencies, 
um, is no longer um, sufficient. We need to put ourselves ahead of the curve as much as possible, take into account the, the data, the science, and push for as much as possible um, policies that can support those people who are most vulnerable. And that was one of the things which um, we were doing at um, COP27, and we're not too sure how successful it is, because there's just a huge disconnect between those countries with the resources and those countries who are vulnerable. And there will be a cost to that. Um, we, <coughs> yeah, there is, there's just basically a complete disconnect between, in some cases, the reality of the situation. So um, I think if, if what Surge um, could <laughs> get out even more would be, would be great. Um, because like from our, our position, for instance, um, there's a lot of discussions on making sure that the people furthest behind are considered first, um, gender issues, whatever. It's like in the discussions, it's largely rubbish. It's not taken into account fully. There's, there's, no mo there's no money going to vulnerable, into the most vulnerable countries. There's no real concern. People with the, uh, with the needs in terms of technology, education, health are continuing to be left behind. People are making very um, well calculated decisions not to put money into those countries and there will be um, intense suffering. But for the developed countries to be thinking that they can escape to their arcs of stability or privilege and not be impacted is just um, extremely naive. So, um, yeah, and it was interesting what Serge was saying in terms of um, those countries, um, like including the Netherlands or, or Sweden or France or Japan, um, the infrastructure and the, and the processes and policies that they've put in place are not fit for the future. So, so in terms of refugees, what we, what we attempted to do in um, Sharm El Sheikh was to bring um, the voices, not just the voices, we were able to bring people to Sharm El Sheikh in order to say um, this highway to hell's already started and if you're in South Sudan or if you're in Pakistan or in Somalia, it's already pretty hellish. And that if you want to look at loss and damage, there's no better example in terms of loss and damage than those people, let's say in Somalia, who've had their fifth um, failed or they're entering their fifth failed planting season, who've lost nine million stock um, in the Eastern Horn of Africa. And if it hasn't been declared an official famine, <laughs> well, it soon will be. So, um, and then who's to say there's not gonna be a sixth um, failed season? Who's to s at what point do you actually see the floodwaters in South Sudan decreasing? Um, so there's, um, and also I was talking to the Minister for, for Climate from Pakistan, and the development gains that Pakistan has been sort of so engaged, like it's been relatively successful with over the last decades, it's just been lost. So this is, this is a reality that we need to be looking at. And so looking at the data, looking at the trends is super important, not just to, I don't say scare people, but um, I think it's super important that we, we, we stress that ignorance can no longer be an excuse for inaction. Like we know what's happening, we just don't know the scale of it. And it's not going to be a linear um, progression, it's going to be a chaotic progression. So, um, so what we attempted to do was to drive this home because um, it's super important that the countries, and this is where UNHCR is, is so concerned, most of the vulnerable countries that Serge was mentioning uh, in the in his presentation, have also been some of the most generous in terms of providing um, security and protection for those people who've been displaced. I, I saw that your reference to a million people going into Europe um, was a was a concern. Like it's, it's again in the whole con world context, a million people moving to to Europe um, is a bit of a joke. When and and I had a, I had discussions with journalists in um, Sharm El Sheikh, sort of saying, "Is Europe going to be flooded by um, by climate refugees?" And I said, "Were you flooded? Were you flooded by Ukrainian refugees?" Let, let's let's be clear: you're being racist. Like it's it's what the right wing media does in order to generate um, exposure. Like, and as Monica says, like the the ability of the world to be able to um, to accommodate, uh, integrate populations 
is there. It's a challenge whether we wish to or not. So anyway, digressing a bit, we'll go back to the, back to the project in the Sahel. What we wanted to do was to say, you can use data. There is data out there in order to, to inform policies. However, those policies are only as effective as the engagement and commitment. We can change the trajectory um, of the Sahel if there is sufficient investment, engagement, if there is a focus on human security and not so much on, on kinetic security. If we focus on vulnerability rather than seeing people as a threat. So um, let's see how this works. This is, anyway, this is a presentation which I did in Sharm El Sheikh. So, um, so also probably somewhat similar to, um, to Serge's point, what we tried to do was um, identify what the key risks climate change and environmental degra degradation, food security, conflict and migration, co and displacement. And so the key element here is to try and avoid react, try and just avoid on reaction and to try and anticipate. And what we also realized was that um, there is an enormous potential to collaborate on trying to understand where the future is going. Initially started with two or three um, institutes, and once we once we came and sort of like started talking to others to see whether um, what they knew, we, we basically created a almost a, a positive momentum of more and more institutes wishing to be involved in what we were doing, and so in the end we end up with about twenty, I would say some of the finest um, think tanks and institutes in the world looking at climate change but other drivers including um, access to water but also food and security, um, crop tolerance and so forth, demographics, um, so forth. And from that we then um, looked at the interrelationships and linkages and this is why it is so important to be able to, much like the, the ecological threat report, it's not just to look at a particular issue, you have to look at each one of them to see how they're um, interlinked. And as Monica was saying in terms of demographics, but then demographics also has an impact in terms of uh, water security. Um, water security has an impact on food insecurity, which has an impact on, on agriculture, which has an impact on, on human security, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so against each one of these, we have to figure out, okay, if the population in Niger is going to double by 20, over within the next 17, 18 years, if you've also got rates of desertification, which is going, and you can also do calculation of that, um, and if precipitation is going to become increasingly erratic and infrastructure is also going to be damaged, what are the steps that we need to be doing now? So you, you start doing your back casting to see how can you build up the resilience? Are there schools already in place in order to um, ensure that girls actually have access to education? So it's like a lot of discussion in that education can't wait, but obviously in many cases it can, depends on where you are. And um, so for instance, I just came out of Mozambique and there was uh, schools without roofs, um, which have not been replaced since the last cyclone. So there's all these examples about almost the insincerity of, um, of what the people are discussing in Sharm El Sheikh and elsewhere. So um, again, I don't necessarily need to sort of go through some of the um, some of the, the results because they'll basically echo what Surge um, provided, but there are different pathways to what the end result will be. It will largely be dependent on what the investments are and what the community engagements are. It's also uh, something which we often underestimate uh, is the issue of governance. Uh, almost all those elements which we were looking at before, if you don't have proper governance, if there is not a uh, a, a proper consideration of community um, prioritization and the role of human security, then most of the planning and uh, strategies are, are not. There was, a, there was another issue too, which I think is super important when you, when you start looking at how um, effective our roles should be in these, in these countries. When I started looking at the Sahel and I was looking at um, what were the, was there a comprehensive strategy? It, there was, but there was 29 of them. <laughs> each, each entity that was interested in the Sahel had their own strategy. Each, almost each UN agency was, was, was looking at their own strategy. So this also um, rubbed to bring sort of like a reality check and sort of say, 
come on guys, you, you need to get your act together because the, the consequences are uh, one of failure. And, and I think we've seen that consistently in many areas within the Sahel. So some of the um, uh, elements there uh, don't necessarily need to push through that. Um, yeah, so that, that, that was basically it. Like we can, <laughs> we, we can um, have a better understanding of the future by working together. Um, it then has to be based with very solid community consultations and prioritisation. I'll, I'll give you a, an example of, um, of Mozambique where, where I spent two weeks before going to COP. And you've got a million people which have been internally displaced by the, uh, by the, the fighting in Cabo Delgado. You've got a country, Mozambique, with limited resources who's been extremely generous towards integrating refugees. But at the same time, you've got a $4.7 billion LPG extraction project um, in the north of the country. When I was asking some of the um, local authorities in the north, which are basically within stone's throw of, um, of where the expatriates were landing before they get taken out to the, uh, to the site, I was saying, what, what, are you, what are you benefiting from this? And they said, well, they said we could have a health centre. And, and they didn't say, what do you want? They said, we can have a health centre. And the population didn't want a health centre. They said they wanted the bridge. And so this is like, and I said, but what about, like, what, where is all the money going to? And they said, we're not seeing it. We don't know. No one's talked to us. But they said we could have a health centre. So whether it's going to Maputo or whether it's not even sort of being transferred, we, we don't know. But this is, so if you want to look at, insecurity and the drivers for insecurity it's just a total disregard for the eight billion people who find themselves in these vulnerable and developing states if you don't take their considerations into account of course you're going to have insecurity of course you're going to have a reversal of development gains and of course you're going to have a situation where um, we're going to be losing many parts of these areas Thank you. Thank you so much. So this is the time when we open the floor for questions. Uh, if you have any, I can see two in the room and uh, still waiting for those online. Three. OK, please. Hello. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nene. I work for GSEF. Um, that was a very outstanding presentation. My question is to Serge. And so, um, especially in the Sahel, are we, you made mention the fact that you know, the ecological threat is, 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 has been intensified. My question is that, has it affected the typology of, of conflicts in, in that region? And if yes, do you think new approaches are warranted at this point? Thank you very much for your question. Uh, I think what we see there is, um, yeah, as I tried to explain in my presentation, combination of different factors. So we clearly see that uh, this is one of the regions, of course, where different forms of or different types of ecological threats are impacting, of course, reinforced by the effects of climate change. And we, we therefore see this combination that also generating more conflict um, and generating also destabilization. So a little bit like, you know, both the other panelists were, were, were pointing out what we're looking for the region like the Sahel is of course to um, mitigate the impact. Uh, I mean, we can different forms, maybe even think about reconstruction, but definitely also increase the levels of resilience. And, um, and of course we see that the Sahel is not the epicenter of one form of conflict, which would, which would be terrorism, and which I would consider more as a uh, technique, technique, uh, technique, tactic and procedure used in other forms of conflict that could be called insurgency or, or whatever you want, you want to call it. But um, the reason why those international terrorist groups or these, these uh, international insurgencies are so successful in destabilizing the entire region, not only Mali, Burkina Faso and Niger, but also Togo, Benin, going down, trying to find access to the sea through uh, Côte d'Ivoire or, or Senegal, for example, where they, they get quite nervous about what's happening in, in, in the region. Um, clearly, the, the, the success of those international organizations is linked to the lack of what we would call resilience, and of course, lacks of, l lack of positive peace. And you know, also resonating on um, what you said, Andrew, I think you, you mentioned a lot of the, of the eight different pillars, all different aspects of positive peace. 
when we would look at low levels of corruption, when we look at uh, b better levels of governance and sound business environment, free flow of information, development of human capital, and equity equitable distribution of, of resources, good relations with your neighbors. So when systems, when countries are investing in all those eight different pillars, we see a positive peace transformation and we see more resilient societies, which of course will be uh, less prone on uh, being impacted by all those different factors generating some form of destabilization and definitely creating an environment in which let's call it negative forces um, would be able to try and of course you find them back in the Sahel you find them back in the Horn of Africa you find them back in some in in north in, in the north of um, of, uh, of Mozambique, for example, where this is not the first time in the history of Mozambique, for example, where a natural resources has been exploited but never redistributed to the population, not even to the country itself. So populations, they also know that from the past and start reacting in a certain way because they cannot find these different aspects of positive peace and aspects of, uh, of resilience. So what we see is definitely um, a d deeper form of destabilization is the interaction of different uh, factors in peace and security, creating an environment in which different forms of conflict can, can, can generate, but definitely more intense, and some of them can crystallize in terrorism or other forms. But uh, clearly, you need, to, you need to look at the level of resilience and the capacity to absorb the shocks those countries are exposed to. Well, seeing uh, Andrew taking some notes, I don't know if you want to take. Yeah, um, I think like it's also easy to say tourism because it just rolls off the tongue, particularly when you talk about Sahel. Um, but then you've got to say, okay, why are people joining these groups? Is it natural that they wish to join these groups, or is it is it an expression of the inequality which is going on? And so, what I've been there, I've, I have spoken to people who have been not necessarily, yeah, who have been challenged by what's going on. And often what we're seeing with climate change, it is, it is exacerbating the structural inequalities which are there. And even if you look at, for instance, the herd of farmer conflicts, you've got a rapidly growing population, as both what Monica and Serge were saying. You've got um, decreasing capacity of herd sizes because of the limiting of transhumans routes, but also limiting of, of access to surface water. And then you sort of say, okay, what is, why do people have cattle? A lot of it has to do with the bride price. And if you're impoverished, if you're not part of the, the clan that have got the cattle in order to get married, then you're pretty upset with life. And so what, what you do have is an attraction for many extremist groups slash extremist groups to say, well, if we get rid of the bride price, this will be much more um, equal for everyone to get a wife, participate, have a family. This is pretty important. So you have mothers who are sort of saying to their sons, go for it, because there's no other way which we can actually get married here. So, so it's, I'm not saying that's always the case, but you've got to understand the community dynamics in these situations, is the is the structures in place at the moment going to support or inhibit peace? And this is where also, when you get states engaging, often developed states engaging in these disruptions, which again climate change is driving because it's the exist what's existed in the past won't be viable for the future. You have to understand. What, what, is, what are the situations at the moment? If you see where some of the biggest attacks in terms of these terrorists, it's in, it's in the market towns. What are the market towns about? The market towns are about cattle. So um, I, again, I'm not saying this is always the case, but the, there are examples there that if you wish to understand the, the reasons for why there is insecurity, you need to talk to the populations and see what are their fundamental concerns about their future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Shivan, I'll give you the floor. Hi, Siobhan Martin, GCSP. And I have two questions. Am I allowed? OK, thank you. Um, so I have one question for Serge and for Andrew, and one for maybe Serge and Monica. Um, maybe the first question is about culturally appropriate family planning. Um, you know, I'm from Ireland, family planning can still be controversial there. In the United States, it's controversial. And so I was just curious about the most populous countries. 
Um, is it more um, coming from within the countries themselves, recognize the future challenge and they're reaching out to the international community for advice and support? Or is it more a trend observed by the international community, but starting from scratch to kind of get buy-in from the, the countries concerned? And so I'd be a little bit curious if it's more international community towards national or it's more national outward towards the international community and what are the implications of that. Um, the second question really is related to what Andrew picked up on, you know, the uh, refugees to Europe, one million, whereas it was 6.5, I think, Serge, you'd mentioned to Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey and Uganda. I mean, seriously, um, you know, Europe is so developed with a much better capacity to integrate refugees. And when you see the countries who are integrating the majority, who themselves um, are, are in, in a pretty unstable situation. Um, and as Andrew mentioned, you know, in Europe, the narrative towards refugees, uh, the way it's portrayed in the media, it's kind of like we're, we're overwhelmed in Europe, you know, we can't take any more, and it's not true. Um, so, so what needs to be done to change the narrative? Can the narrative in Europe be changed? Can there be more of an opening, especially given the aging populations? So the population is increasing in other regions, it's decreasing in a lot of Europeans, so you know, there's an opportunity there. But can we change the media narrative or what needs to be done? Thank, Thank you. you so much, Yvonne. We'll go first to Monica and uh, then to other speakers. Yes, yeah, so... Um, Family planning is um, is a human right. It's um, it's not it's not a slogan. It's enshrined in most of the uh, resolutions adopted here in the United Nations uh, Human Rights Council. UNHCR um, also works on that because we partner with them in many many locations. So what and in and in most of the countries where it actually mentioned here, we run programs there for more than 50 years, and um, it's actually quite interesting because. Um, we have offices in 130 countries, well, 150, but um, uh, developing programs with the government, it's 130. So all these countries that were mentioned here, they actually have um, an agreement with UNFPA by which we are providing um, family planning on a voluntary basis. And, and for us, the key word here is voluntary basis. And of course, we, you use the um, a very important word, which is culturally appropriate. And, and we know that um, part of the challenge is, is often reproductive rights are instrumentalized. You know, or um, I can tell you hundreds of stories of women who walk for miles until they reach the health clinic to get contraception. And then they are asked, have you got the, um, the authorization signed by your husband? And if they don't have it, they will go back and get the declaration, if they can get the declaration, or cases where women cannot choose um, um, the type of contraceptive they, they want to take. So, and, and even this year, we launched a report where we had um, starking numbers, where we were saying that half of all pregnancies in the world are unintended. This doesn't mean they are not wanted but they were not planned. And this really shows you how much control women have over their own bodies, or how, many, how much control you have on a decision that's probably the most life-changing decision um, that you can take, which is to decide if you want to have a family or not. Um, b with all the implications that has on schooling, on getting a job, on charting your, your way forward. So uh, we are constantly working with governments in order to make sure that family planning is available and that governments understand the investment, which is something nice because I'm, I'm, I'm you know, maybe it's my academic background, but, but, but I like uh, words because words mean things. And it's interesting because both Andrew and Serge spoke about investment. And this is some of the messages that we want to put forward too. You have to invest in this type of policies because then you will reap the benefits on climate change, even on radicalization, as you were saying. You know, if you have no hope for the future, you are more prone to be radicalized into um, extreme movements because you feel that you have nothing to lose. And again, it's this cross-cutting uh, approach how family planning, as you were asking, how sexual reproductive health and rights are often a symptom of underlying um, feelings within the population. Can you really um, decide what you want to do with your life? And um, as I was saying, we don't advocate for numbers because there's no perfect numbers. But of course, we try to make countries understand 
where they are going, you know, where they are heading with their population. And even with population growth, um, it became kind of a negative word, but population growth means one thing, means lower mortality. It's an, it's an opportunity for countries if they invest in health and education. It's an opportunity for, and it's an opportunity for them for, um, for development. So, and this is why, I don't know, I think it was you, Andrew, you mentioned the media. Sometimes the media likes to catch the, um, the most um, inflammatory uh, word because it's, um, it's what also leads us into reading a, a certain article. But I think that educating the media into how negative um, this type of very easy, simplest narratives can be and how they can also fuel um, conflict, it's also an important, an important part. I, I know that I went to way beyond my question, but this is what you were provoking me. Thank you so much. Andrew? Yeah, um, I, going on to, to Monica's last point, I think um, the how we phrase the issue is, is super important. So I, I'd never talk about climate threat or climate risks now. I call, I call about climate vulnerability because what many people, they, they want to latch on to that they're on, it's, there's a threat. You have, you have a, there's a huge migration of people from the from the from the south to the north we're all going to be overwhelmed but it's it's an issue of people don't want to move if they've got an option generally like again that's a a, a very wide statement but people like their communities they like their families they like like where every, but they need the support and this is a, there's nothing sh more surer and this is where I just was getting so frustrated in Sharm el-Sheikh about these discussions and I was getting so frustrated with these states who are basically the guardians of international law or that they believe that they are um, and they're the ones who are blocking um, um, ad finance for adaptation. And so everything that Serge is saying is going to come to fruition times if they continue that. Um, the, the funding which we can put in place in order to de-risk the, 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 the issue of human dignity, the issue of human rights, the issues of human security can be addressed. And if you tell me there's no money, that's also rubbish. Like the amount, like the, the amount of money which the oil and gas companies are making in 2022 will be double what it was in 2021, to $4 trillion. $4 trillion. <laughs> like you can't even figure out how much that money is <laughs> and so that's doubling of what it was last year so you can basically say okay that's going to be net profits if not more and so what what all the countries that Serge was mentioning they were just basically saying okay can we get a hundred billion uh, so of course they're really pissed off <laughs> because they're saying look like like is there and um, I, I had to do a press conference this morning. My wife was saying, you can't say that. You can't say that. <laughs> you can't say that. But I'm saying this is what I want to say because, like, there is just a clear discrimination and that's, a, that's a, between um, giving money to those countries who, who need it in order to adapt to the cyclones, to the flooding, to the... To the um, droughts um, that are coming forward. Like certainly there's issues of not, uh, poor governance, I get that. There's also issues of environmental degradation, I also get that. But we need to be able to figure out how we can invest in supporting their capacity. And again, when I was in Mozambique, they had 134 district adaptation plans um, out of 150 districts. And they're saying, look, like, can you help us develop those into projects? And this, this is a country which is sort of saying, look, like, like, <laughs> like there's $4.7 billion being invested in, um, uh, in this oil and gas uh, platforms, but they just wanted some help in terms of coming up with projects which can help their populations have um, shelters which will not be hammered by the next cyclone, which will occur probably in, in two or three months' time. And then we'll all be surprised and we'll basically send out um, WFP and UNHCR and others to sort of have an emergency response. CNN will go for a couple of weeks um, and, then, and then run away. Like, it's like we, we respond to disasters rather than sort of saying we can build the resilience. And this is where 
we all have a responsibility. So I think like the Geneva Security <laughs> the Geneva Centre for Security Policy, um, it almost like I, I, I like to focus on the human security. I do as well. Yes. So, 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 so you don't have to then deal with security issues. Thank you so much. And just on the narrative, uh, or it's oh, yeah, just, just, just yeah. yeah, just so going basically going to the narrative. Yeah, words count, yeah. and so rather than sort of risk or threat vulnerability, um, bringing the human centric nature of it. And so, what was important was again in Sharm El Sheikh was not just let's say Andrew Harper and everyone else dressed up in suits turning up and sort of talking about others, was actually having those people talking about themselves and us trying to take a back, back seat and sort of ensuring that, that, um, that their own voices, their own dimensions were, were brought to the fore. And that succeeded, I believe. B but we're still not in the negotiations. So the negotiations are by people who are generally well-educated, well-paid, and who can retreat to the arc of privilege. That no, none of them have probably lived in a refugee camp or been refugees or lived in a desert or, or suffered poverty. So how can these people make decisions on the future when they haven't really experienced the, what it means to be hit by the impact of climate change? Thank you. you. Yes, please. We are at almost the yeah, end of it's the it's time. Just, it's yeah, really please. one sentence because I was um, just listening to what Andrew was saying. So on Wednesday, the two main divisive issues were the gender plan. There was no agreement on that. And also uh, all the clauses on losses and damages. So it's really about funding. Yeah. It, it, was not, uh, it was about gender equality and the impact of, of climate change, but also on damages and losses um, suffered by the countries being hit the hardest by climate change. So this re is really telling about the mood in the negotiation rooms in Sharm El Sheikh. Thank you so much. I'm taking uh, the executive decision not to give the floor to Serge right now. I'm just going to ask a round of questions that I've received online, and then uh, I'll ask you all to, to answer the questions, Serge, including the, the, the ones asked a moment ago. So first question is uh, coming from uh, Iran, and it's from Andrew. And uh, he's asking um, the gap uh, about the gap between idealism and reality on the ground. Can you advise to how can we minimize this gap while avoiding idealistic proposals? First one, what would be practical steps? Um, second one um, is asking about the vulnerable states and bearing in mind human rights what result-oriented actions would you suggest to not regulate, but to have a regulatory impact on demographics in this region? Like the, the vulnerable regions, the, uh, the question was asked mostly about the sub-Saharan uh, sub Africa. Of course, we heard from uh, Monica that we, you can't really regulate uh, demographic trends, uh, but yeah, I'm putting it out there. Um, and last one, uh, how does the foreseen economic impact of displacement help guide policies for EU engagement in the most affected regions? And the last one, sorry, last one, last one, about water scarcity and how, um, for the time being at least, we managed these water conflicts in a peaceful way, diplomatic way. And the question is about the future. Do you see any, in, any change in trend, you know, having the so-called water wars, uh, as some are talking about, some media is talking about it. So, voila, I will uh, give you the floor, Serge, now. Thank you very much. Um, you know about about the, these these water conflicts. I, I think yeah, the, tr the trend is really not uh, positive. We have seen also an increase over the past decade of those type of conflicts by more than increasing by more than two hundred seventy percent. And and I gave you a list of um, of countries in which they are occurring the most. And those are of course countries that are really also fighting all the for all forms of war. But it's part of it's part of it. I think what we are going to um, to to see in the future is basically. Um, yeah, conflict for resources. 
Those resources can be water, food, can be minerals at some point, because if you want to develop a green and digital future, we will need to have access to certain form of, uh, of minerals, um, and they are in certain parts of the world or under very, uh, very important ecological um, ecosystem. So I think we, 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 the orientation is more towards uh, uh, conflict for uh, resources. But those resources can be completely of completely different types. Three short points about the questions that have been asked before. I think, you know, to come back to, to what you said and also uh, what uh, Andrew said about that, we need, we need to realize that, you know, the vast majority of the people getting recruited and working or, or be active in those terrorist groups, in Sahel region, the MENA region or whatever, they are not like those crazy ide uh, ideological uh, jihadists. Those are people who try also to have a better life. Um, that's the reason why, for example, uh, in the MENA region, Tunisia was providing in numbers and in percentage compared to the population, the largest contingent to, um, to the Islamic State. They're not more crazy than others over there. It's just like when you go through two socio-economic revolutions and you, 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 you're worse off after the revolutions than before, well, sometimes you, you, you go for this job but that is giving, going to give you $1,000 to $2,000 per month rather than being unemployed or surviving on one to 300. That's the sheer reality in, in many, many parts of the world. Therefore, you need to really reinforce those levels of positive peace, reinforce, re, reinforce resilience, and you will not end up in such a situation. To come back to your, to quest, to your two questions, the first one on family planning and, and you know demographic figures. You know, when, when, when I showed the slide, with, when I was saying like, oh, this is when it's the worst, this is the strongest increase. On the same slide, you will see that in the countries most peaceful and most developed, this is why it's the lowest. So I think the solution, for, the solution for family planning, without imposing it on on, on people, is make it, making, I would say, regions, countries more peaceful and more developed. And basically, you know, I'm from the Institute for Economics and Peace, so countries uh, are having high levels of post in peace. This is where you need to in, to invest in, and automatically you will see that. Magically, th those figures are going to to go down. To come back on your last question, I think it's a it's a, it's a very important question. Is this focused on the golden billion? Uh, focus on the West. Uh, you're absolutely right. When you look at the figures of the absorptions of refugees that we have taken in Europe, it's absolutely uh, and we have the capacity to do so. When you look at countries in the MENA region, other regions, what they have absorbed without having the capacities, and just it's absolutely uh, mind blowing. And I remember the first edition of the Ecological Threat Report. You know, when we spoke about those 1.2 billion with the potential to uh, to move, w we received reactions from the, uh, the the displacement community who told us, "You cannot write this because this is going to generate even higher walls in Europe." So it's really a political problem. It's really the, this idea to organize migration, and I think. To come back on this, um, Europeans have populated the world, and I, and I prefer to use the word populated, not to end in, a, not to use other verbs that could also um, describe what we did throughout the centuries. But it's only 50 years ago, people started to come to Europe and started to, to you know, live and establish themselves in Europe. So, do we still need to go through this process to understand that what we did for centuries is not happening for, to Europe? Of course, there is maybe this. Uh, offer and demand. I mean, if it's better with us, why, why should, couldn't we absorb them and with the capacity to do so? So I think we need to, to re rethink our migration policies. We need to really accept the fact that people are coming towards Europe. And we need, as you, as you have pointed out, we need to identify those very positive uh, aspects that migration can. We need to have a positive view on migration. And I think just to give you an example, I've, I've been I've been driven around in taxis in Sweden, in Belgium, and other places by people who had uh, one or two engineering degrees, but came from one part of the world and they could not. Th those degrees were not recognized in Europe. I I've been driven around in Stockholm by the director for um, everything that has to, that to do with uh, infrastructure in Iraq. So the guy really built strong things because we needed to. Like drop a lot of bombs on them, you know, to destroy what this guy had, had built. So why can't we use him to build bridges for us? You know, one of my my son's friends, his um, uh, his mother, is bioengineer. 
she is she's doing daycare for children because she cannot work as a bioengineer. Although there is a there is a um, there is a necessity for bioengineers in Belgium. How stupid is this situation? So that's what we need to look at. We need we need to make sure that, uh, and that's the same thing same thing for terrorism. Terrorism in the West it's less than one percent of the impact, but the focus, as you say, of CNN and others are on this one percent. This is frustrating for the other seven billion. We need to understand is that everything, every time there's a focus on the one billion, this is a frustration for the other seven billion, and there is no there is no necessity to do so. Thank you so much, sirs. I am aware that we are going a little bit over time, but I will allow uh, two other speakers to reply before we close. Uh, Monica, yes, thirty seconds. <laughs> so I think the the investment has always to be made on human rights. It's allowing people to decide what they want to do with their lives and give them the, um, the information and the means um, so they can do it. And I'm saying this about family planning, but I'm, I can say this about education or about any other aspect of your life. Truth is that if you don't have the ability to decide what happens um, with your body, you have little autonomy in other parts of your life. And, and this is why we work um, so much on this. And I just want to end with this um, idea of Sharm El Sheikh. Do you know what inspired me the most? The youth uh, groups in Sharm El Sheikh. That was what inspired me the most. How articulated they were, how they were vocal and in their asks, and how they were organized. And if I was saying that the controversial issues were everything to do with gender and, and on financing, uh, I can also um, reassure you that the most vocals, uh, the, the most vocal ones were young people because they really feel that um, after um, COVID and after, and after all that has been happening, they are the first generation will, that will not have a better life than their parents. And they are really, I'm sorry, pardon my French, they are really pissed at it. And they, want, and they are being bold and vocal because they, they really feel it's their future that's um, being put at stake. And, but I, I came with a lot of hope, um, not only by what the UN is doing together, and, and there were pretty good panels showcasing how we are working together and how we are understanding the challenges, but especially from this movement of, um, of people who are saying, it's our future, we want to work um, on it. We want to, we want to have a word on what it's happening. Thank you. Last but not least. Um, <laughs> the, um, w the, the question was from Iran? Yes. Okay. Just to, um, to say that I used to live in Iran on, in Akhwaz. So, so friends, so hi to the friends there. Um, two, uh, okay, answering the question, we need to have more realistic data and be honest about where we're going. Um, and so going back to my point, there's no excuses for inaction based on what we know. And so hopefully that'll, that will add a bit of a more, more of a reality check. But just qu two quick anecdotes. The, the first one involved discussions with um, Mauritanians and Malians by the border. And the challenges in terms of climate change meant that the access to um, fodder for, for the cattle was extremely limited. And the areas which were in Mali were controlled by Islamist groups. What the Islamists basically said is, okay, you can, um, you can, you have, you can have access to cross the border, go into these areas, if one of your sons join us. He had three sons, and they, were, they said we'd also pay him. And so the farmer said, absolutely no problem. I mean, the herder said, no problems. So you, you just have that, that clear uh, recruiting program. Being very careful getting into the demographic side. Um, if, we, if you want to um, have girls and women having, having the right to, or being empowered, you need to invest in education. You need to invest in giving them an option other than early marriage. You need to give them an option and their families not to basically send them off on early marriage. Because there's, like, particularly in places like in the Sahel, when you do get girls getting married off at 14 or 15 and having their first child at 15 or 16, then by the time they're 21 or 22, they've already got four or five children. So it is just, I, I, and this is again why I'm frustrated with people who sort of saying, who are blocking adaptation, financing, and then sort of saying they're concerned about gender. Mm -hmm. Like, so if, if we can, if we acknowledge where we're going in terms of the climate emergency, if we're saying that some of the most vulnerable groups, including women and, and girls, are going to be at the very forefront of that vulnerability, 
then why are we blocking the legitimate request to help these countries support women and girls? It just makes no sense whatsoever. And then sort of be concerned about a security situation which will increasingly evolve because there's no other way for people to survive. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the all the speakers. I just wanted I of course it's impossible to summarize the discussion, but I was just thinking in terms of, you know, it's a lot about bridging the gaps. First of all, uh, between the haves and have nots. Secondly, uh, between the global level and the community level, as Serge mentioned. And finally, be between this siloed approach and the systemic approach that we all really need. So I just wanted to thank you so much for taking the time coming back from Egypt and rushing to, uh, to the GCSP to participate in this discussion. Uh, I wanted to thank so much Serge and the Institute for Economics and Peace for this collaboration on these events. You are going to have other launches at the GCSP of the Terrorism uh, Index, of the Peace Index, uh, so look out for those. And I wanted to wish you all an excellent rest of the day and the weekend and really hoping for some positive news from Egypt. I know that there are, you know, we, we are not being very optimistic, but I do hope that something is going to uh, happen there that is positive. So thank you so much again, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Yeah.